What's up, everybody? <laughs> Welcome to the stream. I see we got a few people in the room there. You're probably looking at D like, what the heck is going on? Where's the shield? Where's the background? Where's the backdrop? But anyway, to show my total de dedication to the fish hobby, I'm in the D from Brooklyn, Mr. Manuel mobile office, hosting the live stream with my brothers from other mothers, Joe and Steve. <laughs> and we have our special guest here, Mr. Mike. He's going to talk all about i can't even say it because i've been trying to say that mike for the last couple of days <laughs> <laughs> we're we gonna have a wonderful talk here tonight I talking heard. about all things catfish i know i got some feedback from you guys uh throughout the week i hope i'm sounding acceptable uh might be getting some doing? echo here you can Very hear good. me okay yeah okay that's good I don't exactly have the studio. I'm calling this studio Accord, the Accord studio. I get the sound in your house. <laughs> no, no, everybody's going to say, hey, D, your, your wife finally kicked you out of the house. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we're, we're in the mobile studio here, Brooklyn Aquarium Society. Thank you guys for, uh, for paying homage. Thank you for joining us on all of our venues. And thank you for helping us hit... 2,000 members on Facebook. That was a real milestone. I'm proud of it. It's not 10,000. We'll get there sooner, than, uh, sooner or later, but a proud number nonetheless. Um, thank you guys for taking part in the online auction. I know a lot of you guys found out last minute. Um, always working to get that news out a little better every month. It's hard because we had the holiday weekend, the 4th of July weekend. Um, but yeah, thank you nonetheless. Um, please stay tuned and stay up to date by A, being a member of the Facebook page. B, if you're not a paid member, you may want to look into either the online membership or the uh, the uh, general paid membership for the Brooklyn Aquarium Society where we send out our aquatic news and our bulletins via email, newsletter, and other social media. Um, there was something else that I wanted to mention that I can't get. Um, Steve or Joe, you may have it because I'm shooting and in caffeine mode. Mm -hmm. um, I think the website, we got to, we got to have them look at the website because we update everything on the website. Uh, all of our, all of our, uh, uh, presenters, our, uh, our articles, our videos are all access are all accessible. And, uh, it, it's one of the main focus broadcast, uh, places for our club. So correct, correct, check correct, that. Correct. Yeah, stay tuned. The BASNY.org website, uh, your place for everything fishes. And we're not just a freshwater club. We're not just a saltwater club. We're Watch talking about ponds. Already. We're talking about brackish water. We're talking about plants. We're talking about yep. breeding culture, something that I've been looking to get into at some point or another. Um, any All things aquatic. Good. Sorry about that. The dog was going crazy. Okay. <laughs> We're talking about dogs, <laughs> cats, <laughs> fish, fish, fish are going hamsters. crazy. <laughs> Can we put water wings on hamster? I think we could. We could try. We could dress it up. Wasn't that Ringling Brothers that dressed up the pony like a unicorn? That's we right. could dress up like a hamster, like a seahorse or something. <laughs> All right. But, well, Mike, uh, I want to yeah. thank you for joining us here on a Friday night like this. I'm sure you got better things to do, but well, thanks for inviting me. Anytime, anytime. It's always a pleasure. Looking forward to your talk. That's okay. for sure. Joe, you want to give him a proper in introduction? It's um, Mike. I mean, we've known Mike. He's been he's been a, a speaker in Brooklyn in person mm -hmm. uh, more than once, and it's great to have him. He's very knowledgeable. Uh, he is one of the top breeders in the world. Um, he won that that big contest with the breeding contest, uh, which we won't give names. But if you want, you could. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's one of the best in the world, and he's he's uh, he's really big in the uh, uh, Missouri uh, uh, 
Aquarium Society mm -hmm. and several other um, uh, American Killifish Association, American Cichlid Association, and probably American Live Bearers, and I'm sure I'm sure yeah. many others. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Okay, so let's go ahead and grab the screen here. I'll let you know when I see the presentation. I'll pull it up. I see it here, coming in loud and clear. I'll take our mugs out. Good idea. Are you ready? We're ready when you are, Mr. DeVille. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, tonight we're going to talk about catfish, uh, specifically about uh, uh, taking advantage of luck and chance in breeding oddball catfish. Uh, I'd like to work with... Uh, a bunch of different uh, oddball type fish and uh, catfish are among the group uh, that has a lot of oddballs in it. So uh, the title of my talk, uh, oh, I guess I ought to get my photo credits out of the way first because I'll put you all to sleep uh, by the end of the talk. So I always like to thank Gary and uh, Charlie and Diane Brown and Charles Harrison uh, for all the good shots. And then the rest of the ones, uh, you'll see why uh, I always try to get shots from other people. So. Um, but as, as uh, I was talking to uh, D last night, this has been a question that's been going around. What the hell is Siloriformian mean? Uh, it means uh, of or relating to catfish. When I originally put this talk together, uh, it was for the uh, Cataclysm uh, Convention uh, that's held up in the, the uh, M Madison, Wisconsin area on opposite years of the Catfish uh, Convention down in uh, the DC area. So uh, most of the people that were there knew what Siloriformian is, but when I put this on my list of talks, everybody else is like, what is that? What does that mean? So we're going to talk about catfish. And specifically what we're going to talk about is uh, good luck or uh, serendipity, which uh, um, Oxford's uh, dictionary just defines it as the occurrence and development of events by chance in a happy or beneficial way. In other words, uh, it's a happy accident. And that's kind of my uh, uh, modus operandi for breeding a lot of uh, oddball type fishes. And this talk is kind of how I approach uh, removing uh, some of the uh, randomness from uh, trying to get catfish to breed and giving a better chance of success. Uh, it, catfish are kind of a strange group of fish and, and uh, there are uh, currently 38 families of catfish. But when you look at clubs, BAP submissions, um, about 3% of them are made up of catfish, but they oddly only come from four families. Uh, the uh, Corydoridae, uh, the Loricaridae, the Mococidae, which is the uh, Cynodopsis, and uh, the Ochinipterids, which are uh, the uh, woodcats. And uh, for some reason, uh, the other uh, 34 families uh, just don't really get touched uh, hardly at all. And part of that is because uh, there's not a lot of information out there. Uh, most people today kind of think, well, if it's, on, if it's not on the internet, then it never happened. And uh, uh, before the internet, uh, we used to collect all these things called books. And there's information in these books that's just not available online. And most of the information that you can find uh, on breeding catfish uh, is pre-planet catfish, it's pre-internet, uh, and uh, it's just not available uh, in, in a large way. Planet catfish is doing a really good job of getting a lot of information out there now, but even still, a lot of times when I go to look up uh, some new catfish, there's no information out there. So I gotta go back and see if there's anything in the books and this one up here, Modes of Reproduction in Fishes, is a great book. Um, basically, the, uh, the authors, uh, uh, Bretter and Rosen, went out and talked to fishermen, and uh, they talked to scientists and read through scientific papers all over the world and looked at every family of fish that was, uh, in, that was known, basically, at that time when they put the book together. And they looked at how they breed in the wild. And there's information in here that you're just not going to find anywhere else. So that's a, if you can find this at a used bookstore or from a used book dealer, uh, it, it's a great book to pick up. Uh, so 
a lot of times there's not a lot of information out there. I don't know exactly what I'm going to be uh, dealing with when I get a new catfish. Uh, so what I do is I start out with a 30 gallon breeder and uh, I put uh, a little uh, d dish in the front here. This is a, uh, a terracotta pot that go or a saucer that goes under a, a terracotta flower pot. It's about 11 inches in diameter. I fill it with uh, fairly good sized cobbles and rocks. Uh, I'll scatter a few more of them around the tank. Uh, I'll put some plants in there. I like to use uh, Java moss and Java fern, uh, Anubias. I have a piece of uh, driftwood or a couple pieces of driftwood piled in the corner, a sponge filter or a mat and filter in the back. And then I'll have a dish in the back back here that has uh, sand or uh, real fine gravel in it. And then the other thing that I do, which uh, drives people crazy when they come to see my fish room, is I don't keep it too clean. Um, what I've found is that uh, uh, every time I've ever gone collecting fish, and I've been collecting fish all over the place for, for decades, I have never once come home from collecting fish clean. I have always had to clean up after I got home. So that kind of gives me or gave me an idea. We always keep our aquariums way too clean. So you'll see in some of the pictures uh, from my tanks uh, in a few minutes. Uh, I, I don't clean up all of the, uh, I keep the front class clean so I can see in there. But other than that, I don't clean up uh, the bottom of the tank very often. Usually I, for the catfish, I've got a fine layer of sand over the, the bottom of the tank. And then the little layer of detritus builds up over that. And I don't clean all that out. I do change the water very frequently, but I, um, I don't clean the bottom very often. And people notice as they go walking through my fish room, I've got about 110 tanks all together. And almost every one of those tanks has fry in it. And the, uh, the combination of the plants and, and the detritus and the piles of rocks, they all give Fry a place to hide uh, so that even when I'm not paying exact attention to uh, detail, uh, the, the fish may spawn and I can take advantage of that. In other words, I take advantage of the serendipity and uh, I can raise the Fry or at least separate the Fry from the parents until I can see them and then get them out of the tank. So the first thing that I always uh, play around with a little bit is water parameters. First thing, absolutely all the time, freshwater fish are very adaptable, even though uh, all the books tell us, uh, you know, this particular species has to have these particular parameters. And I always say start with your own local water. In some parts of the country, they have liquid rock. Uh, we have that here in St. Louis. And what uh, what we do when we have, uh, when you have the local water is, is the fish are getting uh, adapted to that. So you can do more water changes and you can uh, do them regularly. A lot of times when you're messing around with the water parameters, you're afraid to do water changes. But if you're keeping them in your local water, then, then uh, you don't uh, have to worry about that so much. And you can just do as many water changes as you can. Water changes are one of the keys to success. And then uh, if you're starting to mess around with things, start uh, keeping track of pH and hardness. And if the fish are from an area where the, there's lower pH and lower hardness, uh, you can start uh, trying to adjust that downward a little bit, but uh, do it slowly and just adjust one parameter at a time. Don't change everything. And then with a lot of the uh, uh, fish that come from seasonal areas, you want to uh, kind of simulate what happens at the end of the dry season before the rainy season starts, because most fish will spawn at the beginning of the rain rainy season. So you want to start extending the time between water changes instead of doing them every week, start every two weeks or every three weeks. Uh, or if you want to, if you can't feel you can't get away from doing water changes, then cut them down to maybe changing only 10% of the water or something like that. And then after that, start uh, shortening the time and uh, making bigger water changes. Uh, sometimes I'll even let the water evaporate down almost halfway in the tank uh, until the sponge filter is just barely trickling in there. And then all of a sudden do a big cleaning and everything like that. And usually if you've got catfish and you do some of the other things I talk about, they'll start spawning almost immediately. And then uh, uh, another trick is to add extra aeration. You remove it first so that uh, the, there's very little water movement. And then once you uh, do the big water change, you're kind of simulating all that rain coming in. Add a couple of extra air stones to the tank and just get the water really, really moving. And that kind of makes them think that the rainy season's starting and uh, they'll get going. And uh, a lot of times 
that's all you really need to trigger them to spawn. Um, but I, the other thing I always like to tell people is don't be afraid to experiment. I don't know how many times people have asked me, well, how do I breed this or how do I breed that? And I've given them a couple of ideas and then I'll run into them at the meeting, the club meeting the next month. And, and uh, I'll say, hey, did you have any luck with those uh, catfish you were working with? Oh, no, I didn't try anything. I was afraid of killing the fish. And it's it's like, well, if you only change one parameter at a time and you don't change it a whole lot, a lot of times that's enough to trigger them. But if you don't experiment, don't try, you may never ever get them to spawn. So the first one we can talk about is uh, temperature. And everybody knows, uh, you read all the old books, they always tell you, warm up the temperature, get things uh, heated up a little bit. Uh, uh, back in the day, they used to keep tank temperatures at, uh, at the low 70s, 72, 74 degrees, and they tell everybody, warm it up to 78 degrees, and that's enough to trigger. And for a lot of the fish that we keep, it is. But for a lot of the catfish, uh, like these Corridors paleatus, uh, actually cooling it down is what makes the difference. And uh, I have uh, an ancestral species uh, that uh, I've had them for about 10 years now. And it, it's an undescribed species. They come from the uh, Rio Yuquiale, which is uh, up in the mountains at the beginning of the Amazon. And uh, they are, it turns out they're actually a cold water fish. I didn't know that. I've been keeping them like you would keep any ancestors. I keep them warm. Well, we had uh, our air conditioner go out, and uh, it was out for about five days before they could get back to fix it in the middle of summer, of course. And uh, the water temperature in the tank got up to 94 degrees, and there was absolutely nothing I could do about it. I, I lost quite a few fish that, uh, that uh, week. But uh, when the air conditioner came back on, and of course I was doing water changes, but that wasn't quite enough. When the air conditioning system came back on, it dropped the water temperature in the tank down to 72 degrees because I had turned off the heater in that tank. And you know what happened? Those ancestors spawned. And uh, they produced uh, probably 250, 300 fry. And then uh, they spawned again about a week later and produced uh, another uh, big clutch of fry. And this time I left the eggs with the male and, and he took care of them. So um, sometimes... Uh, moving the temperature down is just as valuable as moving it up. And then something else, especially if you're working with uh, like North American native fish, is to change it up from day to day because the water temperature doesn't stay the same every day. And sometimes it doesn't stay the same from uh, morning to afternoon. Sometimes the water temperature can change uh, if there's a rainstorm or something like that. Water temperature can drop 10 or 15 degrees or um, if it's out in the sun and uh, the area is kind of isolated temperature might go up 10 or 15 degrees over the course of the day. So what I do in some of the uh, temperate fish tanks uh, is that uh, I put the heaters on a, uh, a timer, a regular light timer, and I'll run them for six or eight hours, then turn them off for the rest of the day. And uh, the fish really seem to respond to that. Uh, I've had a lot of luck uh, breeding temperate fish uh, doing just that simple thing. So always uh, don't just think about warming it up. Think about mixing it up a little bit. Another thing, uh, especially with catfish, is that uh, watching for storm fronts and, and changes in the bar uh, barometric pressure, uh, especially with uh, fish like gories and, and uh, some of the hop loaves and stuff like that, they really respond when the barometric pressure drops. And uh, I've got a little uh, secret trick uh, as I've gotten older, uh, the, uh, I've got a little bit of arthritis in my knee. And if I've got some catfish that I'm trying to breed, and we have a uh, storm front coming through and all of a sudden my knee wakes me up in the middle of the night and starts hurting. I know it's time I can go downstairs and uh, I'll do a couple of the things I'll talk about in a couple minutes here, uh, uh, you know, change the water and uh, uh, add extra aeration and do a few other things. And uh, a lot of times that's all that we need for a, a trigger to get the catfish to start spawning. And I've had some luck with some really weird oddball catfish doing that. So uh, it does work. And then lighting, it doesn't pay as much uh, of importance to catfish as it does to other fish. But uh, one thing that you can do, some of the catfish do spawn at night. So adding a, a single LED bulb above the tank uh, for a moonlight uh, and then taking that away uh, after about two weeks and then adding it again uh, after about two weeks, kind of simulating the moonlight. Some of the new uh, LED fixtures, uh, boy, you can even uh, program it in. So they'll go up and down and uh, be like the moon rising and setting and everything. 
But uh, trying trying something like that can help. And then um, if you really want to get crazy, you can simulate, the, again, the beginning of the rainy season, doing the strong water changes and, and everything by uh, adding a strobe light to the room and uh, kind of simulating uh, uh, the rainy season and the lightning and everything like that. Um, it sounds crazy, but it does work. And coupled with that, uh, trying uh, or considering sound. Uh, many years ago, uh, the famed uh, uh, underwater explorer Jacques Cousteau uh, wrote a book. It was called The Silent World, where he talked about the underwater world and the fish and everything like that. But the truth is far, far different from that. Fish, are, especially catfish, uh, are very noisy. And catfish use a lot of sound to communicate. Uh, different ones uh, will make squeaking or croaking noises or grunting noises. Uh, we're real familiar with the the catfish uh, that's down here, Ambladores uh, Hancock Eye. They're actually a uh, um, so well known for their uh, grunting sounds that they're called the talking catfish. Uh, and they will make the sound if you pick them up. They will make the sound if they're stressed. They'll make the sound if uh, two males are uh, displaying for a female. Uh, they'll make the sound if they're uh, courting the females. Uh, so uh, it's important that the catfish be able to hear each other's sound. That is very important. And if, for a lot of us, you go into uh, our fish rooms and you can hear that what we consider a comforting sound. You got bubbles uh, going very loud. Uh, but in the catfish tanks, uh, sometimes uh, if you're having trouble getting them to spawn, sometimes using uh, air stones will uh, kind of quiet things down so the catfish can hear each other. And uh, it sounds crazy, but it really does work. And then again, getting back to the uh, simulating the storm sounds, I've actually been in a few fish rooms where people have uh, uh, the little uh, soundtracks going in the background that play uh, thunder and rainfall sounds and, and other jungle sounds. And it sounds crazy, but again, they swear by it. They say it works. And uh, they're breeding fish, so it, it's got to be... Uh, uh, there might be something to it. And then, of course, uh, something else we don't really think a whole lot about fish, but they do have all the other senses that we have, smell and taste and touch. And a lot of times those things uh, help them get into the mood. So you want to be able to, um, if you separate the male and female, a lot of times just putting a divider in the tank so that the water can circulate from side to side while you separate them to condition them. Uh, but you allow the male and female to be able to smell one another and uh, pick up uh, the pheromones uh, from each other. Uh, a lot of times, uh, especially in some of the more uh, uh, well-known species like the quarries, uh, the males will release pheromones into the water. And these uh, actually cause the female to, uh, they stimulate her to ovulate and become receptive, receptive to laying eggs. And if you don't allow her to do that, or if you don't allow the male's uh, pheromones uh, to be released in the water, then a lot of times uh, you'll never have a, a, a spawning uh, success. And uh, the other thing that a lot of, uh, especially the quarry hobbyists use, uh, you, if you've got uh, a, a group of quarries that are not spawning, they're uh, one of these uh, newer species that are a little bit more challenging. We really don't know if they lay their eggs under the sand or on the glass or what happens. Um, a lot of the quarry breeders actually keep tanks of uh, very common quarries and uh, they let them uh, kind of get stimulated and breed all the time. And when they're spawning and when you start seeing the, uh, the spawning orgy like this, uh, you'll go in there and start uh, dipping water out of that tank and putting it into the tank uh, that, of the quarries that you want to try to breed. And what happens is uh, the pheromones from these other quarries will kind of get the males stimulated and you'll all of a sudden see a spawning chase start. But uh, this is a uh, group of uh, Corridor Schultzi here, and they're doing uh, something that uh, is kind of known as the quarry spawning frenzy. It's pretty fascinating to watch. Uh, as you notice, almost all of those quarries that are doing that are males. Uh, there's generally a whole group of males. They're kind of displaying for one another. They're jostling for one another. Uh, they're, they're actually, there will be some fighting in some species. The, the, they can actually draw blood. Uh, but what happens is the kind of the toughest, most dominant male, uh, kind of think of it as, as the deer uh, in the fall where they start banging antlers or when the, the uh, uh, you see the mountain goats ramming heads or whatever. It's kind of that same thing. They're kind of rutting and, and it gets their hormones going. And, and if you only have one male, this isn't going to happen. 
And there's a chance that even if you've got a ripe female, they'll never spawn. So you want to kind of try to keep a group of the catfish together and let them do what comes naturally. And the weird thing about this is that if you really watch closely, you'll see that only one male mates with, even if you've got a group of females, only one male mates with one female. And she will go off and uh, lay all the eggs. And then when she's done, that same male will mate with another female. So it's like he becomes the alpha male. And you really don't think about that with Corys. But uh, when you've got a group of them like this, uh, it really does work. It really does happen. And I mentioned conditioning earlier. Uh, what that is, uh, is uh, not just leaving the group together all the time, but separating the pair or separ separating a group of uh, fish out uh, put all the males in one tank and all the females in the other tank, or put them into one side of the tank and the other side of the tank, or with smaller ones, you can use like those hang on the box, uh, or hang on the tank uh, box, uh, uh, breeder boxes, and you can put uh, like them, I usually put the males in there and then leave the females in the tank. And that way they've got the water circulating and they can smell each other, but they can't get to each other. And then you wanna let the uh, females and the males both, you wanna feed them real heavily for a week to 10 days. You want to use a lot of high protein foods and especially a lot of uh, meat, really meaty foods. I like to use a lot of worms. I use, depending on the size of the fish, I use grindle worms or white worms. Uh, I use a lot of black worms. And then uh, for bigger fish, I use uh, uh, red worms or I chop them up. And uh, uh, Rosario Lacord actually taught me about, uh, uh, as crazy as it sounds, throwing a couple worms into the blender and kind of grinding them up a little bit for smaller catfish. Uh, we were talking about tetras at the time, but it works for uh, smaller catfish as well. And then what you wanna see after, uh, after not only, a, a lot of times when the catfish eat, uh, you'll see this belly like this for uh, a couple of hours because they just will eat like little cluttons. But once the females are staying like this all day long, then you know that they're ready to spawn. And that's the time when you can put them together. And uh, once you put them together, uh, a lot of times that's all you need uh, for the trigger for them to spawn. Uh, I like to use a lot of live plants. Uh, some people think that live plants don't have anything to do with uh, spawning fish. But uh, a lot of times uh, live plants will help condition the water a little bit. They add uh, smells and sensations like taste uh, to the water. Uh, if you've ever smelled a, a healthy, I know it sounds crazy, but if you've ever really sniffed a, a healthy planet tank, it almost smells like uh, wet garden soil. It's, it's nice and healthy. And it kind of tastes like that to the fish as well. So sometimes you're adding uh, extra tastes and sensations with the plants. And another thing is uh, uh, plants provide shelter and divide up territories. Some uh, catfish are very territorial and uh, this will kind of give them markers. And if it's not the right territory for one of them to breed today, plants are growing, live plants are growing. So maybe in a week or two weeks, it'll have grown enough or there'll be leaves that'll kind of create a private spot or something like that. And they'll create a territory that wasn't there before. And so as the plants are kind of Excuse constantly me, changing, wait. growing. Yeah. Okay. Question. Um, it was asked in yes. the uh, group yesterday, as far as your, okay. when, when you're talking about the conditions and the smell, um, dirt, sand, or gravel? Because I know with a lot of the uh, corridors and species like that, that was the topic of major concern. Conversation, whether it was preferable to have well, sand or, or like gravel. Basically, sand is, is all that I use in all of my tanks. Um, I've got some bare bottom tanks uh, just because it's easier to maintain. And I usually do that when I'm maintaining. But when I'm trying to spawn fish, uh, especially catfish, uh, they have to, have, uh, I, I consider it a, a must have, they must have sand on the bottom of the tank. And uh, part of that is uh, just giving them a natural con feeling at the bottom um, and uh, allows them, you know, a little bit of natural dicking behavior and stuff like that. So, uh, and some of them, as we'll talk about in a little bit, dig pits. So you want to have sand on the bottom of the tank. Um, I, I don't there use was but the big thing about letting mom accumulate in regards to yeah. trying to breed them and leaving that in there. And when you get the sand in there, it became like a nightmare to try to uh, keep one separate from the other. Oh, you don't try to keep them separate. Uh, as I was talking about at the beginning, uh, uh, I, I very rarely vacuum the bottom of the tanks. I very rarely clean the mom out. 
and um, get a layer of sand. You got a, a layer of detritus over that. And like I said, I've got over 100 tanks. Change the water all the time, but uh, very rarely change that stuff up the bottom of the tank. And you'll see some pictures in a few minutes here. Uh, that has all kinds of uh, food in it for the, uh, for the babies. Uh, and I'll talk about that again, too, in a few minutes. But uh, uh, yeah, definitely leaving the detritus on the bottom and not trying to separate it. Uh, we keep our tanks way too clean and okay <laughs> Agree. okay yeah and then with the plants again um in case you miss it they provide a, a safe place for spawning for eggs and for fry so uh live plants are great things to have and then the last thing again is is that they're covered with microscopic life uh even for when you're you know that there are fry in the tank and you're feeding the fry uh, you'll see them nibbling on the plants, and, and uh, as I'll talk about with a couple of the catfish later on, um, they actually hide in, in the plants uh, as well, uh, the fry do. So uh, um, live plants are very, very helpful in a catfish tank. And then another thing which may seem kind of crazy is be sure you have a pair. Uh, this is a pair uh, of uh, banjo cats that have spawned for me uh, uh, several times. This is the female here. You can see she's got a slightly larger belly. Her uh, pelvic fins and her uh, um, pectoral fins are, are a little bit uh, more rounded. They're not as uh, as sharply pointed. This is the male here. You can see he's not as, as rounded in the belly and his uh, pelvic fins, instead of being round or triangular, and uh, his pectoral fins are, uh, the, the first ray of the pectoral fins are very much enlarged and it makes the, uh, the pectoral fin look a lot uh, more narrow than it actually is. Um, but uh, having uh, a pair is a very important thing. Um, so always make sure that you've got males and females. That's why I always say to start out with a group. And then here's a picture of uh, the uh, um, same catfish that I just showed you uh, in their breeding tank. Um, and you can see there's plenty of detritus on, on the bottom and then there's sand. Uh, this is a uh, actually a Tanganyikan sand that's on the bottom of the tank, and these, for whatever reason, these guys seem to do better in that tank than they did when there was a plain bottom, plain uh, sand uh, bottom on the tank. Um, I'm talking about having patience with these guys. I actually had them set up in this tank, and the the detritus and the mulm built up on the bottom until it was at the point where uh, you couldn't see the sand on the bottom, or nor could you see the catfish most of the time they like to bury themselves in the sand a little bit. And uh, the male, every once in a while, would clear, start clearing an area like this. You can see that there's actually a little pit here in the corner. And that's actually where the male uh, would uh, kind of guide the female, and she would lay her eggs up here uh, in the front. And uh, I'd see that behavior, and I really wasn't paying that close of attention. Uh, it was actually during the uh, uh, fish breeding contest that I had with Ted Judy. I was going through so many fish uh, so quickly that uh, I just didn't have time to sit and watch the fish, which I always tell everybody to do, sit and watch your fish. And I wasn't doing that, so I completely missed it when they spawned. And uh, I missed uh, missed it so much that uh, uh, it was another four or five years afterwards before I uh, finally realized that these guys had spawned. I went to uh, move the tank, so I had to clean all the detritus out. And I started feeling around on the bottom of the tank. and uh, I knew that two of the fish had died over the years, and I had originally put a group of five fish in there, so there should have only been three fish in that tank. And uh, I removed the first fish, uh, removed the second fish, removed the third fish, and it's like, wait a minute, that third fish was a lot smaller than I remember. Most of them were bigger. Huh. So I started feeling around and digging around on the bottom and found another one. Okay, there shouldn't be four fish in there. And oh, here's another one. Whoa, here's some small ones. Wow, here's some more. Here's some more. And uh, I wound up pulling, uh, I think it was 25 or 28 uh, uh, fish of various sizes out of a tank where there should have only been three fish in there. And uh, what I found out later on is that this Mulman detritus is, uh, uh, and there were also, I should mention, two uh, big sponge filters in this tank. And uh, sponge, fil sponge filters are a perfect uh, place for, uh, they're covered with uh, ciliates and they're covered with rotifers. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, I got lucky 
And uh, the serendipitous thing was that baby banjo cats hunt rotifers for the first couple weeks of their life. And I had two huge sponge filters in this tank that were just covered with rotifers. This uh, detritus on the bottom was just covered with rotifers. And uh, the baby banjo cats uh, just went to town on it and grew up uh, basically without any help or interference from me, uh, other than changing the water and adding food for the adults every day. So it's important to kind of stay away from being a neat freak, like I, I said earlier. Uh, don't, don't always try to uh, uh, keep the tank too clean. And it's important to start out with a group. I, as I mentioned, I, I started out with a, a group of uh, adult banjo cats. You always want to start out with uh, a half dozen, maybe eight or ten, uh, or even more in the case of the quarries. Uh, I think that's a reason that a lot of people don't have success uh, breeding different catfish, because they don't keep enough of them. Sometimes, like these banjo cats, uh, they cost 10 or 12 bucks a piece. Uh, these uh, Schultzite quarries are probably... Uh, five or six bucks a piece. Uh, this this was actually a group that uh, I had raised and uh, I had spawned and raised. So uh, I didn't actually have to go out and buy all of those, but I did originally start out with a dozen fish in that group. So uh, it's it's just a really good idea to start out with the group and, and let the fish kind of pick their own mates and do their own things. Some of the catfish you'll find are very aggressive and they'll kind of uh, start chasing each other around and try to drive each other out. And at that point, you want to kind of start separating things down a little bit. But for the most part, if you keep them as a group, uh, that's that's the only way you're ever going to get them to go. Another thing that I use, uh, another little uh, spawning trick, is using the matten filter. I started using these uh, about 10, 12 years ago. Uh, for a while, I had these in almost every tank. Uh, you can see what I do is uh, not only do I have the filter, which... Uh, Basically, this takes up the sidewall of the tank. There's a little open area behind it where there, you got a piece of uh, PVC pipe that you have an air stone in, and it runs up and creates a current and draws the water from the tank through the sponge. So the wall becomes a, a filter. And then I'll take uh, Java moss or Java fern or Anubias and kind of stick that to the, the filter, and it kind of builds up uh, this plant wall in the back of the tank. And then I'll pile up a uh, pile of gravel down at the bottom here. Uh, I'll use uh, gravel that's about an inch to an inch and a half in diameter and come out about six inches and go up about two, two and a half inches. And then a lot of times your uh, fish, in, in this case, I was uh, when I was, made this slide, I was talking about breeding coolie loaches and uh, some of the different hill stream loaches. And what you find uh, with the catfish as well is a lot of times they'll spawn in the tank. And I have no idea how they do it. But the fry work their way back to the back, and they wind up here behind the matten filter. The filter, like I mentioned before, the sponge filter is just covered with rotifers and ciliates. So there's plenty of food for them. There's plenty of circulation for them. And the fry, by the time you find them, sometimes are already a half inch long or longer. Um, I now get to the point whenever I'm doing water changes, uh, instead of running the hose, when I stick the hose behind the uh, mat and filter to kind of clean up the detritus that's in there, I actually run the hose into a bucket uh, in case I find fish or in case I find any fry back there. And I have to tell you, almost every time I do that, I find fry. It's just amazing the species uh, that are just spawning in the tanks. And I'm taking advantage of that serendipity uh, of them spawning, whatever conditions are right for them. And the matten filter is actually actually acting to separate out the adults and the fry. Uh, so it's it's a very, very easy way of breeding fish without having to do a whole lot of work. And then another thing uh, that works really well, another thing that people, when I first started talking about this, uh, when I wrote the Live Foods book, uh, people kind of commented uh, a lot that, oh, he's talking about uh, putting leaves in the tank. That's You want to take all that garbage out of the tank. But uh, this is uh, a friend of mine, Danette Williams. This is her tank uh, just kind of showing a pile of oak leaves on the bottom and a few pieces of driftwood in there. And what happens in the blackwater fish especially, um, in the wild, they don't have a lot of uh, microscopic life to eat. Uh, so the babies, uh, when they're first hatched, what they're looking for is that slime that grows on. It, it's actually a, a mixture of fungus and bacteria that uh, grow on the leaves and break them down. 
and it also grows on the driftwood. And that is uh, just a fantastic food for them for the first week or, or 10 days. And with some of the uh, loricarid species, the adults even eat the, uh, the, the slime. So a lot of times that's all they need to have in the tank. They don't eat algae. They actually eat that, that biofilm or, or slime. And uh, one of the things I do have to mention here, notice I'm talking about oak leaves and hardwood leaves. Uh, almond leaves do not work uh, for this particular purpose. Almond leaves have an astringent quality to them that actually kind of kills off the bacteria and they kind of work counter to, to doing this. So you need to use something that's gonna slowly break down in the tank and uh, get that real slimy feel to it. That's Oak leaves work really, really well for that. And then if all else fails, uh, I don't know how many times I've given away a group of fish or a pair of fish and then the person who got them from me, I, you know, I tried everything to get them to breed. And uh, the person who got them from me called me, called me up a couple days later and said, hey, they spawned for me. Thank you. Uh, so I always, before I give fish away or get rid of them now, I move them to another tank. And I don't mean just to another, uh, the tank next to them or whatever. I'll move them to a tank that's higher up on a, a different rack, uh, one that's lower down closer to the floor. I'll move them to a different room. Uh, so there's different kind of lighting over the top of the tank. The water is different. Um, everything in the tank is completely different. Uh, I've got, uh, just to kind of illustrate here, I've got uh, this little Herajardine uh, over uh, uh, just a bare uh, bottom and then uh, over a gravel bottom just to kind of give, give you an idea of that. Um, now I guess I can start talking about some of the catfish. We'll talk about the, these little guys first. These are uh, about an inch long catfish. They're Herajardine. Um, they uh, are often called the dwarf anchor cats. As you can see, they kind of almost look like a little anchor. These guys uh, actually spawn fairly regularly in the tank if you have a group of them. Uh, I keep these guys in uh, five to 10 gallon tanks uh, with a big pile of uh, uh, java moss or a pile of uh, uh, java fern in there so that there's, there's actually areas up off the bottom. These guys don't always like being down on the bottom. They, they like to get into the plants. And what I noticed is that you'll see one of them that starts going from the normal chocolate brown color. They start getting a little orange like this. And then all of a sudden, one day, one of them will be like bright crayon orange and sitting on top of the plants. And what I've discovered is that must be some kind of a uh, breeding uh, cue. Uh, I've never seen, I don't know which sex it is. I've never actually seen them spawn. But every time I have seen an orange one, within about a week to 10 days, I start seeing all these little tadpoles down at the bottom of the tank, all these little uh, baby catfish. And they uh, will eat the same food as the adults right from the beginning. I feed them all microworms. Uh, I also will feed the adults grindle worms occasionally, but I feed them microworms every day. And they also get uh, baby brain shrimp. But if you do all those kind of things uh, correctly, uh, a lot of times you may not even notice it, but uh, uh, the fish will go ahead and spawn for you. I include this picture here. Uh, I spawned a Microglanus uh, iringeri uh, back in the late 1990s. I had no idea what I was doing. I had a 55-gallon tank uh, set up in a lower area in the fish room. It was full of uh, Amazon sword plants. And I saw a bunch of these. I got a bag of six or eight of them uh, at the uh, local club auction. And I threw them in that tank, and I kind of forgot about them. Well, here you can see one of the females uh, is full of eggs, and the other, uh, these are males here, and they're just kind of uh, hanging around the female. And uh, um, I have no idea how they spawned, but uh, just feeding them real heavily with uh, brine shrimp, and, and I was actually just feeding them mostly uh, frozen brine shrimp and frozen blood worms, and then uh, some pellet foods. And uh, we had a club meeting over at the house, and one of the guys said, oh, was down and looking at the tank and he said oh you've got uh, bumblebee gobies and i said no i don't those are uh bumblebee catfish and he's like no 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 you got little bumblebee gobies in here and i said no 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 those are those are bumblebee catfish and i went down and i looked and sure enough in every amazon sword plant hiding at the crown of the plant in between the leaves like straight up and down there were a half a dozen to uh eight or or nine uh little baby uh uh bumblebee catfish uh, for whatever reason, that was just that they spawned in there, and that turned out to be the perfect uh, little hiding place for them, separated out either the eggs or the fry from the adults, and uh, the uh, babies uh, 
grew up in that tank and did just fine. Uh, so again, taking advantage of the serendipity of uh, just having the right situation in there for separating out. Uh, these guys probably spawn fairly often in, in our tanks if you have a group of them, but it's something that the parents are probably going to eat most of the eggs. So you'll never know it unless you've got just, just hit on the right, uh, right setup for them. And then I've got uh, the little uh, microcinid on this. Oh, no, uh, Mike. Yes. Go ahead. That was a that was another question. That was another yes. question that came up in another chat in another meeting. Removing the fry or the egg. No, nope, I big, don't do that. A mortality rate that people experience when they remove the eggs. Right. So right. you think it's better to just leave them? I leave them uh, if I remove the fry. Thing. Yeah, if I don't, if I move anything from the tank, I remove the adults. Uh, I'll leave the, the, the fry in the tank alone. If oh, okay, working. because that was the thing. They People either either they lose them trying to move the eggs, like you lose most exactly. eggs trying to razor them off, yeah. or the fry will live maybe a few days and die off, like the right. big die off. I noticed right. the time with quarry cats, mm -hmm. um, the whole one time I got them, I know a few friends of mine that do it <laughs> a lot. And, and the mortality rate, even if he gives me the fry after maybe right. three weeks, they tend to not make it. Right. And a lot of times that is because they're not getting enough food. Again, like I mentioned earlier, uh, you can even see the sponge filter on the tank here. Uh, it's not perfectly clean. Um, and this is just covered, again, with uh, rotifers and uh, uh, little ciliates. Uh, and uh, when these guys spawned for me, it was the same thing. Uh, the fry were uh, all over uh, the inside of that sponge filter. Actually, I didn't know that they had spawned until I went to take the sponge out and rinse it out, and I pulled the, the sponge off. Uh, I, I now learned, um, and fortunately had, had, pra had this practice at that time, uh, I always, when I remove the sponge filter from the tank, I take it and dump it into a, uh, a little ice cream container so that if there is anything inside of there, uh, I don't dump it down the drain or, or whatever. But uh, the inside of this was just completely covered with, uh, it was almost like a, a ball of little baby uh, uh, microcinodontis. And again, they were safe from the adults. The adults couldn't get them in there. And there was good circulation and uh, uh, there was plenty of food in there. So that's that's the whole thing about that is, is making sure that the fry are, are safe and that they've got plenty of food. So keeping the tank too clean, uh, there's not enough fry for all the, or food for all the fry to eat. Um, these guys, I don't have any idea if they're a scatterer or if they, uh, um, you, you see them, I've got them, this guy like straight up and down. Uh, every place in the tank that I had them hiding, uh, they were uh, actually straight up and down. Uh, so I don't know if that's their preferred method or whatever, but uh, uh, that's why I've got this picture of this uh, little uh, female here kind of uh, all upside, or almost upside down. But uh, again, just taking advantage of the serendipity of having the right circumstances, having a group of uh, adults, feeding them very well, and then uh, having the, a way of separating out the, ad the babies from the adults uh, without even knowing that I was doing it. Does that kind of answer that? Okay, you hit the nail on the head. All right. <laughs> <laughs> because this is because another we one mentioned the movement, moving, moving them. Yeah, avoiding moving them instead. And once again, you have them in more of a less a sand substrate. Yes, yeah, always sand, always sand. Uh, this now, is another Joe, one. Joe oh. and I were asking a question in the back room. Okay. Because everything is about the environment, trying to yes. foster them to breathe. Now, were you, now is it, I know we're talking about frequency of water change. Are we going from warm water to cooler water or the other way around? Like cooler Not water always. and raising the temperature? Not always. A lot of times I will only do the temperature changes uh, at certain times of the year uh, when uh, I'm uh, kind of simulating that change uh, of the uh, uh, dry season to the rainy season. Then I'll kind of cool things down a little bit. Uh, before that happens, I'll kind of warm things up a little bit to kind of simulate the end of the dry season. And uh, uh, basically, okay. that's uh, kind of what I'm doing when I'm doing that. But for a lot of these, uh, if you keep them 
uh, in tanks like like I do, where you've got a big group of adults, you're feeding them really well, you've got the right habitat for them. Uh, a lot of times they'll spawn without having to do anything else. Uh, uh, they may do it when there's a, a, a storm front coming through or something like that. But a lot of times you won't even see that happen. Uh, like with these guys here, uh, this is another one. Uh, um, but does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, more or less. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, if it, if anything else comes up, actually, one of the guys just jumped into the room. One of, one of the guys that just jumped into the room, New York Gold, is a big breeder of of those catfish as well as a lot of Corydoras. And the okay, thing is, okay. getting them from that that fry stage to the adult stage mm -hmm. gets a lot of a lot of uh, eggs a lot of babies but at some point the mortality rate is like so high well what i have uh, discovered with with other fish not necessarily with catfish is that uh, a lot of times the fry get to about two weeks of age and uh, it's usually between two and three weeks of age they just start dying off for some reason and uh, I mentioned that in a talk that I was doing, and, and a, a gentleman came up to me uh, afterwards, and uh, he worked for one of the uh, state uh, uh, fisheries. And he said that at uh, that point in time, the fry are uh, converting over from one food source to another food source. And a lot of times, they don't have the right gut fauna to start processing the new food source. And because of that, uh, they start dying off because they can't quite digest the food. And uh, he was another advocate for uh, having wow. a kind of slightly dirty tank because uh, that's got all kinds of bacteria and uh, uh, things in it that uh, a lot of times winds up in the gut of uh, uh, the baby fish. And a lot of times that stimulates whatever that change in gut fauna is that happens at that point in time. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. And then uh, talking about these guys, this is a little wasp catfish, um, probably a Kesis uh, prashadi, but I'm not 100% sure of that. They're only about an inch and a quarter long. They're really, really tiny. Uh, this is another one that I spawned during the uh, uh, fish raising contest. Uh, this is a male here, and this is a female here. Real easy to tell, almost like Corey's. Uh, looking down, the male's got the triangular uh, uh, pectoral fins, the female's got rounded ones, the male's kind of narrow bodied, female's a uh, lot more solid bodied, and she's also a little bit bigger. Uh, yeah. Uh, I oh, okay, I got a phone message, sorry. <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, <laughs> I was like, I, how did he hear, hear a message? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, boy, that's technology. <laughs> I thought I turned my phone completely off. But apparently, I did not turn down the voicemail part. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but anyway, these guys are a uh, little fish that I spawned during the, uh, or I, I should say I had spawned for me during the uh, fish raising contest. I had them set up in a 29-gallon tank uh, with a real fine uh, uh, from what I understood, these were like an open river uh, catfish. Uh, they lived in the sand, which they do. They spend a lot of their time in the sand. And uh, um, the tank had a few big rocks in there, uh, so that, like cobbles in the, in the water. And uh, the males would uh, dig around them and, and spend a lot of time around the rocks. And uh, apparently they did spawn for me, but I didn't realize they had spawned for me. And after six months, I wasn't really seeing anything except the adults coming at the blackworms when I would squirt them in there. I needed the tank space for other fish, so because uh, Ted was getting uh, starting to get ahead of me at that point. So I caught the adults out, moved them out. I put a pair of uh, pistogrammas in the tank, and uh, uh, they spawned. And the fry were there for a couple of days, and then the fry disappeared. I'm like, okay, well. Try it again. Same thing happened. Spawned again. Fry were there for a couple of weeks and slowly just kind of kept disappearing. Well, I got a bad pair. Or they just won't spawn in this tank. So I moved them to another tank and they, they were fine in the other tank and spawned and everything was fine. So I put a, a, a pair of uh, convicts in here. Convicts, you'd think the fry would be fine. Well, same thing happened. The fry kept disappearing. I had no idea what the heck was going on. Uh, so 
one day I was uh, feeding the, uh, I, I put another cichlid in there at that point, and I was feeding the fry and I was watching, and I saw the sand around the gravel start move, or around the uh, cobbles start moving. And all these little catfish were coming up to eat. And I finally realized what was happening was the little catfish were coming to eat the baby cichlids that were going after the microworms that I was squirting into the tank. And uh, so what I was doing was providing uh, the serendipitous thing that I was doing was providing the baby wasp caps with baby uh, with the live food of baby fish uh, and didn't really realize that that's what I was doing. So uh, again, just taking advantage of uh, serendipity and, and watching the tank and paying attention to what's going on. And then you got the wood cats. These are becoming more popular. Uh, these are a little bit different than most other catfish, uh, though all of the wood cats, at least all the ones I know of, uh, the males actually fertilize the females. They fertilize the eggs internally. And then in some cases, uh, the female, like uh, these little uh, uh, Centromoclus uh, perugia here, uh, the female will actually go find a cave and she'll go into the cave and lay her eggs and then she'll guard the fry. And uh, these guys are kind of neat because you put food in the tank. It's like there's an explosion when they all come out and they're just fish all over the place for a few minutes. They eat all the food and then they disappear again. And you don't see them again until the next time we put food in the tank. And what you have to watch for is uh, that exact same behavior when the female finally leaves her, her cave uh, she'll stay with the fry for about a week after they hatch, and then she leaves the cave. And when she leaves the cave, the fry come out. And when the fry come out, they're gone. Uh, within usually 30 seconds, you'll just see that explosion in the tank of uh, all the adult fish, and they just eat all the fry. So I always remove, put my thumb over the tank, or put my thumb over the cave and move the female and the fry to another tank. That's one of the few times when I actually remove the uh, the females, and uh, then as soon as she comes out of the tank for f or out of her uh, cave for food, I'll go ahead and net her out and put her back in with the adults and leave the fry in the other tank. These other guys here, you might recognize them as the uh, sometimes they call them the Starry Night, sometimes they call them the Zamaracunchi or the Midnight Catfish. These guys get to be about five or six inches long. They're a cool catfish because they spend all their time uh, schooling. They're always out. And uh, these guys uh, are an egg scatterer. So the male will fertilize the female. And about a week or 10 days later, she'll go off and lay her eggs uh, in the plants. So a lot of times, uh, uh, if you buy them from a store where uh, you've got a big group of them in a tank, a lot of times you can buy just the female, bring her home, and, and she'll go ahead and lay eggs for you. So it doesn't count for a BAP, but... Uh, uh, it's still a, a neat way to uh, watch uh, almost instant fish there. And then uh, you've got uh, some of the others, like uh, the, this is Tadia Intermedia. These pictures are from uh, Planet Catfish. Uh, this is a, a, a cool little uh, um, uh, spotted or milky, uh, I think they call it the Milky Way uh, uh, dwarf cat or wood catfish. Uh, they lay these little uh, clumps of eggs that are just covered with jelly. And uh, I had them spawn for me the night that we were having a, another club meeting at the house. And uh, somebody noticed that I had, they thought I had frogs in the tank. And it was like, oh, I got to get those eggs out of there uh, or get the adults out of the tank or something. And I didn't get around to it right away. And then I noticed a couple of the other fish in the tank were nibbling at this and they kind of spit it out right away and shook their heads. And actually the jelly has some kind of a real nastiness to it that, uh, um, the other fish don't seem to like. So fish in the tank don't even bother the eggs. And then once they hatch, you see the fry look like little tadpoles. And pretty soon after this point, they start swimming. And at that point, the other fish in the tank uh, will start chasing them down and eating them. But again, I found out that these guys like to hide in the dark and they look for that uh, hole down the middle of the uh, uh, hydro sponge filter. And uh, I thought I had lost all of the fry and again, when I went to clean out the filter, I pulled out the filter and I dumped out like 50 or 60 uh, little baby uh, uh, Milky Way cats that uh, uh, had found found their way to hide in there with all the food and the good circulation. So uh, again, taking advantage of the serendipity. I already talked about the uh, banjo cats. But again, uh, you see all the pictures that I have of these guys when I've got them sitting in my hand. They always flip over. I, I, they just do that. I don't know why they do that, but even when you catch them in a net, they always flip over. They're always upside down like that. 
Uh, this is what a female looks like in the tank. Uh, um, you can see that she's already full of eggs and everything. This was a young female, uh, not quite uh, full grown yet. Then you've got the hopelow catfish. Uh, these guys uh, actually build a bubble nest at the surface. Uh, the male builds a big bubble nest, and then uh, the female will swim up there and lay the eggs, and then the male guards the nest. And uh, you very quickly learn that the males are very, very good guardians. If you stick your hand in the tank, uh, they will go after your hand. Uh, and they do bite. Uh, doesn't draw blood, but it does surprise you. Uh, a lot of times, though, uh, when you have that thunderstorm coming through or that storm front coming through, you'll see the uh, spawning orgy start. Uh, here's a couple of ma males here uh, just kind of starting to get ready. And within about an hour of this picture, they had built their nests. Uh, you see this little white tassel thing here. Uh, this is actually, um, oh, I forget what the heck they call it now, but it, it only comes out when the males are getting ready to spawn. Uh, so when you see that, you know that spawning is imminent. And you can see these males have the nice uh, thickened uh, pectoral fins. And uh, the females uh, don't have the uh, enlarged pectoral fins. You can see that it's a lot smaller. Uh, and this is the female that actually spawned with this male uh, not too long after that. But again, this guy was uh, kind of showing off uh, for the, uh, the camera when I was taking the pictures. Um, and uh, uh, these guys are, are really, really good at, uh, at spawning and really good at caring, caring for their fry. Uh, again, these guys like temperature a little bit warmer, uh, so they're 80, 82 degrees. Uh, that's a, a good trigger temperature for them. And uh, it's a really good idea once you get one male that builds a nest to remove all the other males. Otherwise, he'll spend all his time fighting and won't spend a lot of time courting the female. And then you've got uh, some of the moco kids that are very popular. Uh, for, for some reason, there don't seem to be a lot of Americans that work with uh, Cynodonus nigroventris, the upside down catfish. These are much more popular in Europe. And uh, there are quite a few people that have spawned them over there. They're a cave spawner. They actually lay their eggs on the surface uh, uh, or on the uh, roof of the cave. And uh, the female will guard the uh, guard the fry, and uh, re once once they're released, though uh, they're fair game. So it's a good idea to uh, remove the adults from the tank and let the fry go in there. And then you got the cuckoo spawners. Uh, you got uh, multifasciatus and uh, grandiops, and uh, everybody's kind of familiar with uh, the way they spawn. So uh, kind of tricking the cichlids into uh, thinking that they're uh, carrying a mouthful of eggs of cichlid eggs when they're actually carrying. Uh, couple young catfish. And then these two uh, are very, very popular in the hobby, uh, Petricola and Lucipinus. Uh, the original uh, Petricola gets to be about five inches long. It has uh, smaller spots on the head. Uh, Lucipinus is uh, three and a half to four inches. It has larger spots on the head. It's kind of the easier way to tell them apart. Unfortunately, now there are all kinds of hybrids in the hobby. So most of the fish that are in the hobby now are probably hybrids. Um, these guys uh, will actually spawn in a uh, cave. It's a good idea to have like marbles on the bottom of the cave. And uh, once you hear the adults kind of spinning around in the cave and hear the marbles moving in there, uh, take the adults out of the tank and then about a week later you'll have fry. And uh, the baby's uh, real easy to raise on baby brine shrimp. This is another one that's uh, Becoming more popular in the hobby, uh, this is uh, Halobagris uh, flavus. They call them uh, yellow uh, dwarf catfish. Uh, they are about a, two inches long maximum. This is the male over here, and this is a female over here. She's got a little bit uh, different color to the body. Uh, when she's full of eggs, you'll start seeing uh, she gets kind of a, a swelling here, and kind of a greenish color. I haven't actually seen the eggs. I'm not sure if the eggs themselves are green or if that's part of her body color. But uh, what happens is uh, uh, usually you'll see a really fat female for a couple of days and a couple of males hanging around her. And then uh, about a week or 10 days later, you'll start seeing little baby catfish around the tank. Um, they, I, I always have them in tanks with a, a large layer of Seuss washer tang on the bottom so that uh, the bottom's kind of always uh, fairly well covered. And uh, I see I get fry in there without having to really do anything else. Uh, so this is one that's uh, if you keep a grip of them, you'll probably have good luck if uh, getting them to spawn. If you can uh, keep the uh, give them a place to spawn where the uh, fry can get away from the adults. And then the chakas uh, are another. About how really, large do they get? Which one? 
the last These? one, the flopper. Okay. The yeah. maximum size is about two inches. Uh, usually a little bit smaller than that. Oh, wow. Great. Because I've been to the nano fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a really cool little bit. And the other neat thing about them is that the uh, flavus uh, spend a lot of time out in the open. and They'll come out to eat during the day. So you get to see them. It's not a catfish that hides all the time. Uh, this is a catfish that hides all the time. Chaka bankansis. Uh, there's another one, Chaka Chaka. Uh, they call them the frog mouth catfish. Uh, it, the mouth literally opens from this to this this side. It's about that big around. Uh, they will eat. Um, they they love to eat shrimp, uh, and that's actually probably the best thing to feed them. But they will eat worms and all kinds of stuff like that. And you'll start seeing the female get so big. Uh, they they hide in individual caves, but then when they're ready to spawn, you'll see the male and female get together in the same cave for a few days, and then the female will be back in her cave, and the male will be guarding the eggs. And uh, usually it's a good idea to remove the adults, uh, the adult female, and then just uh, keep feeding the male in the tank, and if he starts eating again, you know it's time to try to get him out of the tank because the eggs have hatched. And uh, the fry are really easy to raise um, on uh, microworms and, and uh, grindle worms and stuff like that. And they'll be taking baby shrimp within a couple of weeks. Uh, they grow pretty quickly. And this is another one that's uh, pretty common in the hobby, uh, Agamixis uh, pectinifrons. Uh, this is one of those catfish that you buy a group of them, put them in a tank, and you never see them again unless you go back at night. Uh, and look in the tank, and uh, all of a sudden they'll be out swimming around, and they'll be twice the size they were when you originally put them in there. Uh, if you get really lucky, you'll start, uh, after about two years, start seeing the female uh, filling up with eggs like this. Uh, I've had them spawn for me. I, I've heard that they're a scatterer. I've never actually seen them spawn, but I've wound up with young fish showing up in the tank. But that was in a tank that had a uh, lot of cover on the bottom, so that uh, the adults weren't able to to uh, prey on the on the fry. And uh, other than that, it, it was the most boring tank I had because you never saw anything in the tank except at night when I put the food in there. Then the, the adults would come out, and then uh, one day I started seeing baby fish coming out when I was putting food in for the adults, and it was like, "I'll be damned!" They spawned. So that's another one that you got to have patience and. Uh, start with the group and uh, uh, just hope for the best and, and kind of set things up so that uh, things will uh, go really well for them. And then the last catfish I'll talk about is the catfish that does not belong in the hobby. Uh, it's Pangasius, uh, the iridescent shark. Uh, these guys are actually really easy to spawn. That's one of the reasons that they're in the hobby is because they're incredibly, unbelievably prolific. Uh, but in order to get them to spawn, you have to get them up to sexual maturity first, which is about 18 inches. I had a customer that called me um, that uh, wanted me to come out and start maintaining his tank. Uh, he had a, uh, a sort of a detail shop, and he had this 150-gallon tank in the uh, built into the counter. And it was getting hit with sunlight every day, and it was just bright green. And you couldn't see into the tank to even see that there were these big catfish in there. But uh, I cleaned out the, the, the tank, did a huge water change, put an extra filter on there, uh, got the water uh, nice and clean and the tank nice and clean, and realized that he actually had nine of these fish in there. And the smallest was about 16 inches long. And I told him, you need to, they don't belong in the hobby, they belong out in the wild, and uh, we need to find a place to, to get these into something much, much larger. Uh, they're too big for this tank. No, 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 they're, they're sharks. I want to keep them. I was like, no, they're catfish. No, they're sharks. The store sold, sold them to me as sharks, and I want to have sharks. And I was like, well, they're not actually sharks. They're freshwater catfish. It's a freshwater tank. They're not sharks. And uh, I said, they're, they're, you just, you're not going to be able to keep them alive long term. Let me find somebody to take them from you. No, 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 not going to do it, not going to do it. Uh, next day, I get a call from him. Uh, the whole minute and a half of expletives about how I ruined his tank and uh, his tank was milky white and uh, it just smelled disgusting and I did something to destroy it and if I didn't fix it he was going to sue me and everything like that. So I went down to see what had happened and uh, 
it turned out what happened was by adding the extra current and doing the huge water change and by having um, this group of nine adult, uh, young adults, but still adult, uh, Pangasius uh, catfish or iridescent sharks, as he was calling them, um, the water change and uh, the sudden change in water current actually stimulated them to spawn. And they laid so many eggs that they had completely covered the intake of the filter, and it looked like uh, there was a softball on it. And he was right. The water was just like milk. And I explained to him what had happened. He's like, okay, I don't want this to happen again. How do we stop it? I was like, we have to put them in a bigger, a bigger place. And I was fortunately able to find a place uh, where uh, they were able to go into an indoor uh, pond uh, at a, an office park. And uh, the pond was about 18 or 20 feet across, and, and they were very happy in there. But these guys in the wild, they're a schooling fish. And they get to be about four inches, or four inches, sorry, four feet long. And uh, they travel in groups like this. There's just no way that this in any way is a, a proper uh, aquarium fish. But they are easy to spawn if you do uh, get to that point. So the last thing I would like to do is invite everybody to come to St. Louis uh, for the uh, American Cichlid Association convention in a couple of weeks. And uh, we've got uh, great speakers. We've got great vendors lined up. Uh, it's not going to be the traditional uh, ACA convention because of COVID. Uh, we decided to keep it smaller, uh, so we're calling it a convention light. But uh, we're not going to have a show with it. That's what that means. And we're not going to have any side trips. But we will have everything else, uh, including the uh, the babes auction and all the uh, the regular fish in the auction and people selling uh, fish out of their rooms and all that good stuff. So uh, if you haven't decided to do it yet, uh, might be fun to come down to St. Louis and, and try it out. So thank you very much. Now I'll ask if anybody has any questions. Let me bring everybody back. Great talk. Trying to follow the questions in the slide. I have missed anybody. Those of you following, doing this live publication mode. I guess you were, you were that thorough, Michael. <laughs> you covered everything. <laughs> That's all right. Like I said, I put everybody to sleep. So the main, I know the main, you the went main, into pretty good detail. Yeah. The main hmm. topic that would, yeah, you got, and you got a lot of specifics in there. The main thing was the breeding, the stimulation of the breeding and the environment. We had that talk regarding the leaves and the sand, and it seemed like a lot of the parts of blue, like, you know, people kind of magically get that combination together, so nobody really knows before what triggered. There's a lot of hypothesis, but the, you know, I, I've been doing the leaves since a friend of mine, Philippe, told me, you know, they don't buy almond leaves because, of course, they have almond trees over there, but they don't use that for catfish. They only use those for beta. They will use oak leaves. And I said, well, I got a whole yard full of those. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the, the hardwood leaves, uh, oak and beech and, and uh, maple and stuff like that, uh, they actually uh, form a um, uh, kind of a good surface for or an environment for growing the uh, the little uh, bacteria or fungi or whatever it is that uh, makes them get that slimy coat to them. And like I said, a lot of the uh, baby blackwater fish and a lot of the adult blackwater fish, some of the catfish especially, will eat that uh, that slime coat. And uh, it doesn't build up on the uh, almond leaves because, and the reason that the better people use them is uh, because they kind of create water conditions to uh, uh, help keep uh, egg fungus down but they're trying to do something completely different than what you're trying to do when you're trying to uh, uh, convince catfish that we have. Uh, the reason I guess you'd say a lot of this is hypothesis because there is no information about a lot of these guys out there and you're gonna have to kind of figure it out on your own. So that's why I talk about uh, setting up the tank with uh, uh, different surfaces and, and uh, different uh, microhabitats in the tank uh, to see what uh, the fish will go for and where, where they'll go. And, we don't always know what that'll be. 
And uh, a lot of times uh, you just have to take care or take advantage of like the title of the talk, seren uh, serendipity. Uh, just uh, take care of, or take advantage of that uh, when it happens. Yeah, okay, we got a question from Yari, and then I'll get to Joe's. Um, Yari says, knows that the species of fish, however, especially still involved in being sex, and life, also have two other sects. Does that occur in any cat? Okay, I, I can't hear what you're saying, Dave. If you're, if you're, uh, no, I'm saying, the question was pertaining to the change in sex during a lifetime. I think, I think Yari is referring to like clownfish. If you keep right. them a certain group, that they'll dimorph. Like you'll, you'll have a, a male go to female or vice versa. Do you yeah. have a species of yeah, the, the catfish don't really do that. Once uh, once their sex is established, uh, they don't change sex. Or at least I should say none of them that I'm aware of change sex. Okay, regardless of the school. Right. Yeah, what, you, what you're using with that group of uh, adults is you're yeah, kind of letting them pick a mate and kind of use some of the others of the same sex to uh, to get them excited and get them kind of uh, almost running like the, uh, the deer do. Because I think other than like the bellies, I know catfish is one of those species that are pretty hard, especially the smaller species, like pretty hard to tell unless you just got to get a group of them, a large enough group of them. Actually, for the most part, they're pretty easy to sex once they're adults. The problem is that most people don't keep them long, long enough to become adults. Um, or they don't keep a big enough group to, to uh, see the differences in the sex. But uh, generally, the males will have uh, uh, thickened uh, pectoral fin rays. Uh, sometimes they'll have a thickened uh, dorsal fin ray. And uh, generally, the males will be a little bit smaller than the females. Uh, generally, the females will have pelvic fins. The males will have uh, triangular uh, or uh, square-shaped uh, uh, pelvic fins. And then sometimes the uh, head shape is a little bit different. And then some of the, uh, like the lower carrots especially, uh, some of the lower carrots, the males will get uh, uh, a, almost like a beard uh, that they uh, have on the head or the face. And sometimes that'll even be seasonal. It won't be there all the time. And other ones, you'll get uh, the males having a, a, like a real rough surface uh, that you can feel uh, more than see on the uh, a caudal peduncle right in front of the tail fin. Now, Joe, what were you asking regarding light sensitivity? Is that in the fry or that in reading? Um, okay. Well, my question, Mike, was how do you deal with light sensitive eggs and fry? Well, pri pri primarily, uh, uh, I allow, like I said, that buildup of uh, detritus on the bottom. Uh, I'll have, uh, like I showed, that pile of leaves in the tank. And a lot of times the fish will seek out a spot that's darker, uh, that's kind of away from the light uh, to spawn. And a lot of times um, they'll just go ahead and, and spawn. Again, that's, that's kind of the point of my, uh, my method of uh, breeding the catfish is kind of giving them the... Uh, uh, the environment for them to go and choose the best place uh, in the tank uh, for laying their eggs or uh, raising their fry. Um, so, my, I guess my point was when you go to move the fry to a, a larger tank, a grow out tank, if you know those, those that particular species of fish is, is sensitive to the light, how would you, um, how would you introduce them? And then would it be over a period of time where you start adding more light to the tank? Well, generally, uh, my catfish tanks, uh, I don't have light over the tank. Uh, some of them I do have plants in, and those I do have a, a fairly dim light over the tank. But again, like you saw, they were uh, Anubius, uh, Java fern, Java moss, stuff that doesn't really require bright light. Um, so there isn't a lot of light over the tank to start out with. And then... Uh, Generally, I'll move the adults, not the fry, and let the fry grow up in that tank. 
so that they've already got the kind of established habitat there. And uh, generally, light sensitivity has not been a problem for me. Hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, David, there was another question on the comment here. It said, here's a question. I know some of the species of fish, especially salt, would have evolved to change sex during their lifetime, and some have also more than yeah, two I sexes. Asked. Yeah, I'm I sorry? asked that one. Like more oh, you did? I'm sorry. I didn't catch yeah, that. I'm sorry. I asked that one. That okay. was, uh, I think that was more geared towards species like clownfish. He said that that has a seen yeah. that oh, okay. in, the, uh, in the brushwood. But now, have you done any studies regarding salt water catfish? Is oh, that's that's a good question. No, I've never kept any saltwater catfish. There are only a few uh, uh, saltwater you species. Challenge, you got to challenge you, Mike. <laughs> I I really I saw some schooling species of saltwater catfish. I was I'm always curious. Like there's a lot of fish included the research of like freshman brethren, but a lot of these in certain rivers kind of go into brackish water. Right. Right. So I was really and like I said, curious as to trying to move, like trying to uh, acclimate some of these to salt, or if we've been able to feed any salt water species. We're we're all migrating towards uh, uh, getting uh, what do I, I the term, but home culture species rather than capturing wow, self propagating and. and Obvious propagation. So what I really I'm looking for my sort of my breeders out there. Yeah. <laughs> or well, to challenge uh, some of the guys. Yes, yeah, a lot of the uh, saltwater fish are actually easier to breed than some of the uh, uh, brackish water fish that uh, move uh, between fresh and salt water uh, uh, for re fairly regularly, where you've got to uh, basically uh, change the. Uh, salinity of the water on a daily basis or even a couple of times a day uh, for some of them. Uh, I've, I've raised some of the pipefish that way. And uh, it's it's actually a, a fairly compl complicated process. So it's not something that uh, yeah. you can uh, just do very easily. There's a, there's a challenge for you, Joe, master breeder. <laughs> Well, I can it's tell good. you, I, I bred one of the uh, brackish water pipefish, and uh, I actually, uh, it took me about five years to uh, figure out how to get them to spawn in a tank. And uh, I wrote up a whole set of steps that I found that you had to follow each of the steps. And then I gave away, even to universities, I gave away hundreds and hundreds of them. And I never, ever met anyone who was able to successfully uh, uh copy what I had done. And I was on the fifth or sixth generation, and I finally just gave up and stopped uh, sharing them with people because uh, it was like, they're, they're just killing my fish. <laughs> well, it's funny, it's funny you mentioned that because last month's meeting, I, I was sort of trying the same thing, trying what other people have done. I never get free. I have some that I gone from fresh forward and I've done it with killifish. When you mentioned the leaves and the mom, mm -hmm. I actually took the mom from the container pond and put it, I did all my water chain with the pond water. All of a sudden I saw baby killies and the fish started breeding in both of those <laughs> So now I'm wondering if I could do that with catfish because that seemed to be the trick. It was the outside war, not the tapping, mm -hmm. even the moan that they were feeding on. I've been trying to do that for two years. Hmm. Well, like yeah, I said at the beginning, the don't be afraid to experiment. Yeah, when you mentioned the oak leaves, it, it definitely may have sparked it because the mineral content is like mud. It's like, well, mm -hmm. salt water, we use miracle mud and things like that. The, right, right. The, you know, to put the nutrients in the system. Which water is. That'd be a good experiment for any out anybody out there with the, take the well, There are actually uh, some of the uh, uh, crypt uh, uh hobbyists. Uh, there's a there's a group of them that they don't keep fish; they just keep the plants, 
and uh, they actually go out into certain streams in certain areas and collect uh, special types of uh, uh, clay that accumulate in certain areas of the streams. And uh, they use that. They swear that, that uh, the bacteria and everything that's in that is perfect for getting their crypts to grow. Hmm. So probably be the same thing for the fish. Hmm. Uh, now, Joe, you can ask these questions. You're sending them in the private chat, so I'm noticing them a little bit later. But uh, what was the most difficult or most complicated caterpillar species that you ever spawned? You're fading out on me again, D. I, I didn't. Yeah, David, that. you're getting low for some reason. Yeah, um, Joe asked a question in private. Yeah. What was the most difficult species that you spawned or made? Well, all of them have their challenges. Uh, the one that took me the longest uh, to actually realize that I had spawned them, I guess, uh, was the uh, panther cats. And uh, that, they were in that tank for over 10 years before I uh, actually realized that they had spawned for me. Wow. So. That's persistence. persistence. <laughs> yep. Wow. Ten years. Yep. Wow. Those BAP points were really worth it. Yeah, I know. They really, they really made you work for those points. <laughs> yeah, they did. But you know they wouldn't give me any more than uh, for a cardinal tetra or something yeah, is, like is that. There any so. fish, is there any Dang. fish you just gave up on that you just couldn't breed? Or? I haven't. I've had a lot of them that I've had trouble getting to spawn for me, but I haven't given up on any of them yet. Uh, I just see that as a challenge. Okay. Very good. Okay. Your sound is off, David. David, your sound is off. David, you're off. Nothing's there, David. Yeah, it helps when I it helps when I unmute. There we go. That's don't yell there so you go. <laughs> so so Aquafunk Aquafunk Aquatics asks. Other than red tails and shovel nose, are there any other cat type hybridized? If not, why? Oh yeah, there's all kinds of them that hybridize. Uh, actually, uh, probably most of the Cynodonis that are coming out of Eastern Europe are uh, are hybridized, uh, which is really strange because, you know, uh, especially uh, like Cynodonis granulosus, if you could actually just raise those particular catfish by themselves. They would be a fantastic uh, uh, fish, but for some reason they're hybridizing them with other species, and it, it just doesn't make any sense. But yeah, a lot of uh, catfish are hybridized. Hmm. It's not as if you can just throw a bunch of catfish in a tank and hope for them to crossbreed. I mean, people no. do that particularly. There's so many species that will do that, but I never heard of that. Before. No, most of them. Yeah, most of the quarries and stuff like that, you would think that maybe they will, but uh, uh, they are actually, uh, the pheromones that stimulate them to spawn um, are fairly species specific. Uh, so you'll usually uh, wind up with just the particular species uh, spawning in that tank, um, even if you've got more than one different species in the tank. Uh, I don't know why that they don't crossbreed, when you can take the pheromones from their water and use that to stimulate other species in other tanks to spawn, but for some reason they just don't. So, um, but yeah, there are lots of other catfish mm. that uh, will hybridize. And most of the ones that are hybridized, like the uh, red tails and the uh, shovel nose, um, those are actually man made. Those are not uh, natural hybrids, those are uh, uh, made in a test tube man-made cat species yep yep so they do, do that with a lot of those commercial species. like are those fish that we used to seeing commercial well a lot of those are actually uh the reason that they were created was because they're food fish and they wanted to see if they combined oh. the two of them if they would wind up with a, a what they call hybrid vigor they get a bigger better easier to care for uh uh new fish that uh, comes from that um and generally those Channel become food or something like that. yeah uh, but 
like channel cat. A lot of times they wind up becoming food and they never uh, make it into the aquarium hobby unless somebody just happens to be there and says, hey, I wonder if I could sell those. And sure enough, somebody will buy them. So. Sure. <laughs> Well, we're seeing a lot of that now in a lot of other species. Yeah. Not crawl, not hybrids. I call them like mutation. A lot of like mutation, but not a kind of cross species. A lot of kind of forced certain mutations. Selling them, especially I see them in Oscar. A lot of cichlids so spread that. Yeah. I can't even tell what they are anymore. So. Yeah, yeah, like the the new ones, the are the new ones that they take uh, uh, the convict and cross it with the blood parrot, which is already a, a kind of a bizarre cross. Yeah, and the, they uh, turn those into the, the blue stripe uh, pop belly, a pop belly convict. Yeah, yeah, well, that, they look crazy. I just saw some uh, long fin balloon rams. Oh, they Why? Look horrible. They can't swim. Uh, yeah, but well, I, I guess there's somebody that likes monster. everything. So. But, but yeah. why breed a uh, long fin Oscar when an yeah. Oscar is going to pick at the fins? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just because but, you can. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there's always can. somebody who likes them. So. Yep. It's Dr. It's Frankenstein. Right? We've become a Frankenstein. Huh. That's right. True. And I know Aquafunk said, are they sterile? But So they're not sterile, but they just won't breed. Yeah. Yeah, some of the some of those uh, crosses are sterile and other ones aren't. So it just uh, depends on how closely related the parent species are. And it seems like the parent species will cross with most other species, which is really <laughs> odd. I mean, the convicts, the rams, mm -hmm. the parrots, the uh, the red devil. I even see the red devil and the parrot are pretty close. Yeah. A lot of them stemming parrot. All cross bred. I don't know how that gets into yeah. or overcrowding. <laughs> Maybe they just crowd them into one system. Well, I guess it just depends on uh, if you got uh, two horny fish of the opposite sex in the same tank at the same time. And <laughs> they'll just do what comes naturally. <laughs> True. I think we covered a majority of the questions. Okay. Okay. Again, Mike, we uh, thank you for spending your Friday night with us. And well, thank you for talk. inviting me. Very detailed. It's not quite yeah. the same thing as uh, being there in Brooklyn, but uh, no. Well, you know what? When we're open again, we'll have you. We'll have you back. There you go. <laughs> you know, That's and, for uh, sure. We're we're all looking to get back. You know, unfortunately. It's, yeah. Yeah, I know. I can't. It is wait. what it is right now. But thank you. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. We're all done. I think we're done. Take care, Mike. Good seeing yeah, you again. Nice Take care. You, Dave. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. That was good. That was a good. That was a good meeting. I really enjoyed it. He really Very got the details. I know thank you enjoyed everybody. it. Everybody. Yep. Appreciate everybody. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, when we have these discussions, I always try to post the events way in advance on Facebook. So if you guys have any questions, we always uh, ask them in advance. We can we can come up with speakers based on those questions, which I do with my treatment everybody else. So thank you guys for participating as well and for asking questions and sharing this with you. Goal to go to bed smarter than when I got up. We keep cutting out, Dave, but something's going on with your thing. Yeah, I'm I'm mobile, babe. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. Have a good night. Be safe. I sure I'll hope you, you take month. this. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs>